Amen. Open your Bibles, would you, to 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off back in verse 22 in a Bible study that I've entitled, Born Again for Eternity. Born Again for Eternity. We left off in chapter 1 in verse 22 where it says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. In our last study together, we learned the value of loving one another and loving our community with this fervent love, this fiery, on-fire love. The natural response of lives purified by the blood of Jesus is obedience, Obedience in the truth. And love is God's mark in your life. It it is evidence of his presence in your life. Remember we learned, and you can jot it down in John chapter 13, in verse 33, it says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You'll seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come, so now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so what's exactly new about this love and loving one another? I mean, this is not a new command in the Bible. It's all over the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it says, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because I am the Lord. So what is this new part? The new part of the commandment to love are the words that Jesus says, as I have loved you. That's new. That's a totally different way of relating to one another. That was new to the disciples, and it was a new way of love for you and me, the love of Jesus. I mean, we can all define love in different ways and we can all express love in different ways. But what Jesus commands is that we love as he has loved us. In the newness of the new covenant. In the newness of the agape love. When you read through, let me give you an example. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have a display of love. It's not a complete definition of love. I don't, like, I don't like using that. It's not a definition of love. It's more of a display. And, and it's, there's so much more to the agape love. But this is a great example. Pick up with me in verse 1 of chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but not have love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. And then he begins to display to us, listen, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, verse 5. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. This display of love is not something you and I can work up on our own. We can't just take this as a list and say, okay, this is what I will be. No, rather, this is the work internally of the Holy Spirit, the transforming work inside of us. It's a new way of relating to one another. It's not the kind of love of a romantic comedy or definitions of love from some song but rather the self-sacrificial, unconditional, spiritual love 
that is welling up inside of us and it needs an outlet. And now verse 35 in John 13 makes sense that there's a mark in the world that this special, unique, agape love of God demonstrated among a group of people, a collective group of people. When, when the world, when those outside of the church, those we might term unbelievers, you know, your family members, the skeptics, the critics, the, the angry ones against the things of God, when, when the world experiences this type of love, they recognize a distinction they don't experience this love in the world. They don't experience this love at work. at work. They don't get it. It stifles them. It stops them in their tracks. Well, I mean, what's a church without love? I mean, you could call a church without love a, a social club. You can call it a gathering. You could call it an audience. You can call it a multitude. You can call it a crowd. But a group of people knit together by a common love is known as the church of Jesus Christ. Love covering a multitude of sins. Love being the lubrication when we have friction with one another. It's easy to gather a crowd. Don't misunderstand and mistake just the merely gathering of a crowd as the church. It's easy to gather a crowd. I mean, if we wanted to gather a larger crowd here, all we needed to do, all we would need to do is announce that, hey, we're giving away a BMW. Come on out to church. We're giving away a BMW and get your chance. But you have to be present. I mean, we'd have to add services. The people that need a new car, they're here in a heartbeat. We could gather a crowd. There's a lot of things. Hey, come on out. We're going to burn the church down. Oh, I want to see that. I've, I've heard about believers being on fire, but that? And people will come. It's easy to gather a crowd. However, the church requires common love. And the church lives in common love. This testimony of Jesus in John 13 is something that came to pass in a real way in the first century. The common love of the early church puzzled the Roman Empire. They didn't understand the love among the brethren. There were a lot of things about this group of believers they didn't understand, but one of them was the love of the brethren. They didn't understand it. They, this group of people that would gather together, they sang together, they ate together, they endured persecution together. They were the best servants in the homes. They were the best slaves as much of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves. And even after they were born again, they continued to be the best servant. They began to excel in all that they, they were the most faithful. The, the gatherings of the early church were so intriguing to the Roman government that they sent spies into the congregation. They sent spies to find out what was happening among them and report back to them. Tertullian writes that the Roman government was so disturbed by the early church as Christians were increasing in numbers and because they wouldn't even bow down to Caesar and they wouldn't participate in idolatry anymore, they wouldn't take what was required of their, to demonstrate their loyalty to Caesar is where they drew the line. They drew the line when they were required to take a pinch of incense and sprinkle it on the bust of Caesar and bow down to the image of Caesar to express their loyalty. And they would refuse to do that. They would not bow down to the emperor or any image of the emperor. And so the Romans, the Roman government began to think that they were disloyal. And spies went into Christian gatherings and came back with a report that read something like this. And I quote, these Christians are very strange people. <laughs> Anyone amen that? <laughs> these Christians are strange people. Listen, they meet together in an empty room to worship. They don't have an image they bow down to. They speak of one by the name of Jesus who is absent but whom they seem to be expecting at any time. And my, how they love him and how they love one another, end quote. That was the report. What would spies come and find if they entered into our congregation? 
as it's reported that perhaps that's happening now. What would they find? Would they find a room filled with love? Would they find a room filled with rebellion? And what would they find in our hearts and our lives for us? What's our reputation to the watching world? Well, I hope that the transforming power of God's love would put us in a position, certainly we need to draw our lines, but would, that we would draw our lines in agape love. And that the testimony would come back to go, man, I don't, I don't understand them at all. But boy, do they talk about Jesus a lot. And there's a demonstration of care and concern for one another and for the community. Peter understood this coming back now into 1 Peter. He understood this. He grasps the teachings of Jesus and now he's reminding us. Remember Peter's writing to the early church under great persecution. Under the worst horrible persecution seen at the hands of the Roman government to date. And it's not merely the outward behavior that's vital. But it starts inward. It's the purifying, as he says in verse 22, of our souls. You and I cannot purify our souls. We, we, we are unable to do that inward work. And so we focus on the outward. Many times uh, in a congregation like this, the good news of the gospel will go forth that today, I declare to you very matter-of-factly that if you will turn to God, and repent of your sins, he will forgive you. He will take away the guilt and the shame. He will adopt you into his forever family. He will begin the work inside. And in a few moments, you'll have an opportunity, both in this room and watching online or listening on there, you'll have the opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive the forgiveness of your sins. But I know any time the gospel goes out, one of the responses is simply this. I'm not ready because my life is so bad. Perhaps if I clean up some of my behavior in the next few months or weeks, if I can just clean some things up, Pastor, then I'll be in a better position to receive that forgiveness of which you speak. I'm just not, I'm just not worthy of it. I, I just, if you knew, Pastor, what I did last night, what I was involved in, if you knew my past, if you knew my rap sheet, if you knew where I came from, you knew where I was born, you knew what I was into, then you would preach the gospel to me differently, is what some people think. Because we're just so caught up on the outside. We just think, you know, I just mean to make myself presentable. I need to make sure that I take care. I've got this bad habit I got to get rid of. I got this bad attitude. And when I get rid of it, then I'll be in a position where I can receive the Lord Jesus. But see, the Bible says that your souls are purified. That souls are purified. You are unable by your outward behavior to ever touch your soul. And neither are you by your behavior ever able to deserve or earn the forgiveness of your sins. No, Jesus Christ died for you and for me. He did something you could never do. I know of which I speak. I was one of them. Sitting in a church very similar to this, hearing uh, the pastor teach about the love of God, and I just began to think, talking myself out of it. Like, I mean, God may love people, but I'm outside of the bounds of God's love. That pastor doesn't know me because if he knew me, he wouldn't declare that to me. I'm so bad. I, I'm worse than he knows. I've done bad. I've thought bad. I, I am bad. And so maybe, maybe God will love other people in the room, but certainly not me. And it was a battle for me to humble myself. I didn't even know I was humbling myself. I didn't even know what was happening. I just knew there was a fight going on to believe God at his word. The work of God starts inside before it ever changes the outside. It's only by the spirit of God, not in your own energies, in your own efforts, that you receive the forgiveness of sin and that you walk in the agape, unconditional love of God. What you're looking for in love can only exist in the family of God. It can only come from him. And I'm so thankful I have a family of believers to go through tough times with and dark days. 
that I'm in a community of believers that are filled with encouragement. I mean, that's what we need during this time. You don't need, and I don't need, all my bad attitudes stoked by your bad attitudes. I need to be encouraged. (laughs) I need to be exhorted. I need to be reminded that there's a God in heaven that loves me, and no matter what happens on earth, God is unmoved. He's working all things together for the good. That he loves us, and he hasn't changed his mind, no matter how it feels or what we're facing. And the fact that tough times bring out more love and less hatred among believers is true. And it could be that the dark days and difficult times you're in right now, stirring up all this hatred and anger and frustration and and, and just the fleshly behavior that you haven't seen in a long time, or maybe you have and it's just more now, is an indication that you're not walking in the love of God. They're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. Why aren't you bearing fruit for the kingdom? Well, because of government. No, that's not why. Well, why aren't you bearing fruit for the kingdom? Well, because I was laid off. No, that's not why. Why aren't you bearing, well, and you have all, no, the reason you're not bearing fruit, the reason why you're not, because you're not walking in the spirit. Because the Bible promises if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of your flesh. That you walk in the spirit, you will, the fruit of the spirit is love. So I believe the Lord would remind us today that God has done the one of purifying and some of you need to be purified and that we would learn and be reminded again to love one another. Notice verse 23 now is where we left off. Having been born again, born again, that phrase originally comes to us from Jesus and it refers to the millisecond moment that a person is transferred from death spiritually into life. And the only way you can see heaven, like it says in John 3, 3, Jesus said, the only way you're going to be able to see the kingdom of God is by being born again. You know, sometimes you talk about that phrase and you, you might talk to someone, what, what kind of denomination or where you go to church? And so, well, you know, I go to that non-denominational church over there on the corner in, in Aurora. And he says, well, you're not one of those born againers, are you? Well, well, there's no such, there's no other type of believer. The only way to be saved is to be born again. Once again, Jesus reminding us that the work of salvation is outside of us. It's outside of our abilities. Only God can give us new life. We've been born again. It's so familiar that we might miss the beauty and the wonder of such a thing. It's such an amazing thing to be born again. To remember that you've been purged from your sins. It it means that we receive a new divine nature. We become members of the royal family. We're new creations in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. For many of you, being born again means you've been delivered from your addictions. You've been delivered from your hatred. You've been delivered from your past. The, 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 the curse of bad behaviors or the habit of bad behaviors has been handed down generation after generation is broken with you. Everything changes in your family when you're born again. That's what it means and much more. And we just kind of think, well, yeah, I'm born again. And maybe even embarrassed about it. You're not one of those born-againers, are you? No, 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 not me. No, I just go to church. And not even that much. No, the Lord wants to remind you, you're born again. And notice he says, you were born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. So all of us were born of corruptible seed, you know. We were all born in humanity. We were all born... Our natural births physically gave us a corruptible nature, a corruptible body. We are decaying every single day. I know it's not a popular topic in our culture today, but the Bible declares to us and our bodies will remind us that all of us were born in sin. All of us. And our lives are not getting better and better. The moment we were born was the moment we started to die. And certainly many have a long lifespan, and for that we're grateful. But you have a lifespan nonetheless. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that we face the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death, physical death. And we decay every day. And some of you would think, wait a minute, Ed, I work out every day. I take care of this body. My muscles are getting bigger. I'm not decaying. I'm buffing out, you know. Well, hey, if you're not decaying, then why do you use deodorant? 
And then still some people, I don't use deodorant either. I know, we all know. We all know. No, our bodies are decaying. And seriously, apart from Jesus Christ, there's just decay and lostness. So when you were born again, it wasn't corruptible. See, it's not temporary. It's eternal. It's not just something you get and you take it away from you. You were born again of incorruptible seed. And then he says, notice, through the word of God, which once again lives and abides forever. The eternality of the word of God, the souls of men, the word of God, eternal. And he compares it like in verse 24 to grass. All flesh is as grass. And the glory of man is like the flower of the grass. Here in Colorado, of course, in the right season, the grass and our lawns look very nice for a short amount of time, but they look very nice. Nice and green, you take care of it. The flowers begin to bloom. I don't know the difference between the ones that last forever and the ones that last temporarily, but you know, there are certain flowers that you get at certain times. When they bloom, it's very beautiful, very colorful, and it's a wonderful season. But the grass soon turns brown. And the flowers, they die. They are no longer blooming. They fall away. Their beauty is only for a season. Everything down here on earth is not permanent. Remember the context of Peter. Right? This is why we teach the Bible verse by verse. You, you gotta, when you think of the grass now and you think of the flowers and you think how it's green and brown and you think of the beautiful flowers and the petals falling, the, the context is trials. So you, you get to sense that you start to think that trials are going to last forever. And they're not. In Jesus' name, your trial will come to an end. Hope, most of us hope that it will come to an end and we still have some extra time to enjoy a life without trials. You know, we want them to end now. But for all of us, our trials will end the moment we die and enter into the presence of the Lord. You have a promise from God. It's like the grass. The grass doesn't stay perpetually green. The flowers don't stay perpetually bloom. They're temporary. And, and you can imagine as you're on the run and you have the government after you and you're going to be lit up in, in Nero's Roman gardens and, and you're just like lost to everything and you're reminded, no, I've been born again. This isn't going to last forever. There are seasons. There are seasons I love now. I didn't grow up in a place with seasons in Southern California. I grew up in, in Southern Cal. It's sunny all the time. It's either dry sunny or wet sunny. That's the way it is. And I got used to that. I spent my whole life there. Moving to Colorado, I learned that there were seasons, real seasons, that they all come in distinct times. In Colorado, sometimes you can get all seasons in one day, cycle through. And as I began to experience seasons here, it really began to make sense that life is like and has its own seasons, doesn't it? You know, you have the winter time of difficulty and hardship and harshness and cold and bitterness and everything's brown and dead and, and just dormant. And man, trials, they can be like that. It's just so hard and challenging and difficult. And yet winter doesn't last forever. And that's a good thing. It cycles through to another season. What comes after winter? Spring? Or fall, which one? Spring. Okay, so springtime is when everything starts to blossom up again. And the grass starts to get green again. The flowers, I mean, we, I don't know, I don't understand how this works, but some of you are flower people. But Marie planted tulips in the corners of our, of our yard and they will never stop blooming. I thought they were only supposed to bloom one and they keep coming up. It doesn't matter what we do to them, what we put over them, what uh, changing the backyard, it doesn't matter. They're always popping up and they're vibrant for a season, and then they go away, and we enjoy springtime, and then springtime goes into summer, which is, oh, yes, so good, summertime, vacation, and time away, and summertime starts to wind down in fall, and then you, things start to go dormant again, and the leaves turn colors, and, and it gets cooler, and you feel it coming, and then boom, winter comes. And I love to describe that when I'm teaching in other places as I teach about the seasons of life because we all go through them. 
And that the trial that you're in right now, even if it, if it feels like it's never going to end, that's not the truth. It's going to end. I wish I could give you the date, but it's going to end. How do you know? Because you have had your souls purified. You've been born again. Not of corruptible seed, no, but incorruptible. You've been born again by, not by a church, not by a religion, not because you were baptized as an infant, not because you went through confirmation, not because you went and, and you were an altar boy. You, no, you were born again by the power of God through his word. God gives the, you weren't born again because of Calvary Chapel, Pastor Ed, some priest somewhere. You were born again by God himself. He did the work. On the inside first. And God's word is the tool. He says not only at the end of verse 23, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, but he also says in verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. The God's word stands strong for all eternity. And even though man has his seasons, God's word is applicable to every season of your life. God's word is sufficient for you. This book has been around a long time and it's still here. This book has outlasted all of its critics and the critics that are criticizing it today, the Bible will outlast them too. And unless they're born again, they're going to wake up after death to a rude awakening of denying the word of God their whole life. And then some are going to wake up to an even greater rude awakening as they have tried to steal the faith away from believers, from kids, from people that know and understand God. And then there are people that just try to undo your faith. That, you don't want to mess with the people of God. Because you're going to have to answer to God for that. The word of God is imperishable. It's permanent. It's permanent. It's eternal. And there, are many, there have been many who tried to discredit it, condemn it, hide it, undermine it, get it out of people's hands. You know, every holiday, there's always articles, there's always news stories, there's always front page on the Drudge Report is some report of undermining Christmas and no, Jesus wasn't born and on and on and on it goes. But the Bible has proven to be true. Voltaire, the French author and humanist, the rationalist and the atheist held a copy of the Bible up in the air and smugly proclaimed, quote, in a hundred years, this book will be forgotten and eliminated. Shortly after his death, Voltaire's private residence became the headquarters for the Geneva Bible Society and became a major distribution hub for the very Bible he assigned a distinction. The word of God has been effective in our lives. It's been effective in my life. We were talking today as pastors going through some discipleship together and one of the things uh, that I shared with them that, is that a pastor has a devotional life. You know, we're learning again and being reminded of the qualities that the Bible describes of, of a pastor, of a spiritual leader, an elder in the church. And much of them, most of them, they're all repetitive. They're just reminders to us. Like Peter says, as, as he writes later on, he says, I'm just reminding you in Second Peter, just reminding you. But a, but a pastor has a devotional life. That this, that's a non-negotiable. I don't mean like you do your devos. I mean you have a devotional life. Your life is one of devotion. And part of that devotional life is to be in the word of God every day. A lot. Read it. Have it read to you. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Keep it in your back pocket. Make it pop up on your, like we have so much access to the word of God, but we have a Devo life. That if you just open the word of God, a, a Devo life is more important than a shower. A Devo life is more important than a, than, than a breakfast. Spiritually, you need your breakfast before physically you need your breakfast. Or you can do it at the same time. But you got to have the word of God. It's got to speak to you. Because I'll tell you what, as soon as you are up, as soon as you are awake, the world is bombarding you. It's coming after you with the philosophy and the, the thoughts of this world. You pastors need a Devo life, but not you need a Devo life. It's like, well, yeah, of course pastors do. You're right. You agree with me. So do you. Or you just need to wake up and let the word of God speak to you. And just like if you were in your Devos today and you're like, oh man, having been born again, I've been born again. And you begin to think, man, I'm so thankful, God. You, I, I remember my past. You know, with, with the exception of... Um, Marie, 
I don't think there's anybody in the room tonight that knew the old Ed. Why? Because you met the born again Ed. And that's actually a really good thing for you. And a really good thing for me. I, I think for most of you, I met the born again you too. And that was a really good thing, wasn't it? It's a really good thing. And you just read it, you're like, man, you're being reminded. Where else in the world are you going to be reminded that you were born again? I mean, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, but the word of God is going to teach you the new life. And you're going to be a man or a woman of the word. The word of God has been effective every single time it's been opened and read. How careful we must be not to take the word of God for granted. God has spoken to us and he even wrote it down for us. Cultures, leaders, styles have all come and gone, but God's word has remained and will remain the same eternally. It hasn't changed. You not only want to have a devotional life, but you want to train yourself to ask the question when issues come up and when difficulties come. Well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a theologian. You have to be seminary trained. Just ask the question, what does the Bible say? And then open it up and ask God, what does your word say on this? I need to know, Lord. What do you have a word for me? I need to know, go, I need to know where. I need to, I need to understand it. I need to know the background. I, I want to know what you have to say. And the good news is that you and I have been born again, and immediately we began to understand the Bible. I wonder how many of you today have a testimony like I do that before I was saved, I tried to read the Bible and couldn't understand it. I just couldn't get it. It was a weird book to me. And I later found out that I would have never been able to understand it because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. I, I didn't, I would never, you will never be able to understand the Bible unless you're born again. And, and every time you open it up, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, which the Holy Spirit will say, you don't understand it because you don't have a relationship with me. The Bible is a relational book. It's not a religious book. It's a relational book. It's not a textbook. It's a manual for life that the Holy Spirit wants to use in your life. And although the outward man, like grass and flowers, what Peter's saying is although the outward man's perishing, the inward man's being renewed day by day. How? By the word of God. By the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man's being renewed day by day. And he ties that together like Peter does. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Isn't that good to know? Our light affliction, it's working for us, not against us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So if you have your Bibles open already, turn to Psalm 19. If you don't, get it out on your phone or open up the Bible in the chair in front of you. I want you to come to Psalm 119. If you've ever doubting the efficiency and, and the efficacy, I should say, of the word of God, someone, by the time you finish reading Psalm 119, you will be convinced. And I want to give you a section of Psalm 119. And what I want to do is ending our time together is I want us all to stand and read this section responsively. So let's stand together. There's 176 verses. And we're going to do five of them. So pick up with me, or six of them, something like that. Pick up with me in verse 17. And so I am going to ask Henry to come back up here. He's going to read. Uh, Cadence, you guys listening on the radio right now, pause. I know it's different. Pause what you're doing. Get focused in. I want you to read the Bible with us. And here's what we're going to do. Whether you're on the radio or online, you're in the room, we're going to read responsibly. I'm going to read the odd numbered verses beginning in verse 17. And for the sake of Cadence, uh, Henry is going to be reading the even-numbered verses as we read together and just kind of allowing this little paragraph. They're all the paragraphs are powerful about the Word of God, but this paragraph will be very encouraging to us related to the eternal Word of God. So verse 17 says, Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Read out loud. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Okay, so read out loud because this is going to be aired on the radio later on and people are listening live right now, but this is going to air. So read out loud 
Uh, and if you want to pull the mask down a little bit, that's fine. So you can read out loud. So verse 18, you guys already read. Verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. And the church says to that, Amen. Amen. So pop up back up. And Father, we ask for the Spirit, your Spirit, to come upon us. Just as we look at this, as I, I read this again, uh, I might live and keep your word. Wondrous things from your law. Do not hide your commandments from me. Your judgments. I want to long for your judgments at all times. I don't want to stray from your commandments. I have kept your testimonies. Your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delights, my counselors. God, that's our desire. We want to be men and women of love, and we want your word to be our counselor, to bring delight to our souls. And we want to be encouraged and strengthened as we turn our hearts and our attention towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to